Hey everybody, it's Zachary Jeans. Today is day 59 of 365 days going through the New Testament. And we're in Mark chapter 15. So I feel like spring's just around the corner. Can't wait. And uh, with spring, we'll have Easter and good times. So uh, before we get started, let's uh, let's ask God for help. Lord, I love you. And God, as we look at you and your crucifixion, um, God, help just please bring to me the words to share and for us to uh, understand. Lord, I love you. Thanks for letting us go through the Bible. It's in your name I pray, Jesus. Amen. So, excited. All right. Chapter 15. Mark, verse 1. And as soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered, You have said so. And the chief priests accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, Have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer, so that Pilate was amazed. So the only thing he did there is take the Fifth Amendment. Actually, we get our, a lot of our laws from the Bible uh, in America. So we, we get the Fifth Amendment, you know, the right not to self-incriminate, uh, the right to not answer questions uh, from the Bible and from passages like this, especially. So, um, but Jesus says, you know, you've said it. Are you the king of the Jews? Well, you said it. And he wouldn't say anything else. So, now at the feast, he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for him. And he answered them, saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him up to be crucified. So they'd rather have an actual insurrectionist and murderer than this guy who was a real threat to them and their authority and their everything, their popularity, their leadership. Um, and he, you know, Pilate saw it clear. He's like, they envy this guy. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace. That is the governor's headquarters. And they called together the whole battalion and they clothed him with a purple cloak, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him, and they began to salute him. Hail, King of the Jews! And they were striking his head with a reed, and spitting on him, and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak, and put his own clothes on him, and they led him out to crucify him. So now that whatever that was for a trial with an interview with Pilate and uh, parading in front of the crowd. Now it's on. And now the full brutality of the Roman Empire is coming down upon him. And these are unbelieving people that have no sense of, you know, you would say the Roman gods, they, they were, they were for the most part, uh, 
you know, kind of an atheistic culture, right? And, you know, the idea of this guy rolling around town, uh, you know, getting praised on the back of a, you know, cult, right? Being brought into the city a week earlier, like he was, you know, a great general or a king, right? And uh, a week later, the, this battalion that was there in Jerusalem, they get to beat the crap out of him and let him know how they really felt. Wow. And the thing, the thing I say wow about is Jesus and his angels, assuming that the vast majority of them, in fact, probably all of them, maybe one of them turned and believed, but maybe all of them just denied him. When Jesus comes in his power with his holy angels, I mean, there's going to be payment. Payment. So, mock, mock Christ and slap him with your heart as much as you want, but there's a judgment. I would just say, I'm sorry, Jesus, please help me. It's where I'd go with all of it, but each to their own. And they compelled a passerby, or rather, let's, let's go to the mocking part. Then we'll get to Simon of Cyrene. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace. Oh, no, 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 no. Right, okay, my bad. Sorry. We are at Simon of Cyrene. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he didn't take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for him to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right, one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Ha! You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, he Saved others. He can't even save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down from now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. Again, We'll get an account of one of the thieves, the robbers, actually turning in, a, in another gospel. But the real emphasis here is that everybody, almost everybody, except save like a couple of the uh, apostles or, or people who were following Jesus and then some of the, the women and, and Jesus' mom, everybody turned on him and mocked him and just to the nth degree. And again, it's that contrast from like a week before and all the weeks and years before that, the three years before that, it's all, this is the Messiah. This is the promised one, but he didn't do it the way they wanted. And because he didn't do it the way they wanted, in the case of the Pharisees and, and, and high priests, they, he didn't submit to their authority and do it in concert with them. So they're envious of him. In the case of the people who wanted Romans kicked out and just overthrown in Israel to be delivered, like King David uh, delivered Israel, like they wanted that and it didn't happen then. And, uh, you know, some of them just wanted a free ride, free bread all the time. And as much as Jesus did for miracles for him, it was never enough. Never enough. But all these things were him giving a taste and a projection of eternal life where there is no more need for, you know, hunger. 
right? And and there is a place where, um, you know, people act in concert with God in heaven. And the world is delivered and injustice is judged at the final day and in heaven. This whole idea that there would be a period of time between, and, and the idea that the Messiah would be, you know, murdered like this, it was really, I mean, you can read in Psalm 22 and other places where it seems pretty clear that there was evidence that there would be suffering for this one, right? Um, but they just couldn't buy it. And it pissed them off to the point of just spewing hatred. They just wanted to be delivered and they didn't get to be delivered the way they wanted. And do I always want to be delivered the way I want to be delivered? Man, I've cried out to God <laughs> to deliver me for some stuff. And, and he made me stick it out through th some things. And I'm glad he did. I mean, there's a couple times when, like, the Lord let me out of something. And I probably should have stuck it out. It's almost always best just to stick it out through the hard thing. Do right by God, stick it out through the hard thing, see it to the end, and then move on when he shows you where to go next. Anyway, I digress. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, Behold, he is calling Elijah. Someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let's see if Elijah will come take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly this man was the Son of God, or Son of a God. There were also women looking on from a distance, from whom and among whom were Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James, the younger, and of Joseph, and of Salome. When he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him. And there also were many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's a rhetorical question, and it's a there's a lot there for a short little Bible study, but why did God forsake me? And it goes back to his time there in the garden we just read about. Father, if there is any other way, let this cup pass from me. It's both a gutting, like, feeling the nearness of God the Father his whole life on earth and also being an eternal person that had been with God from the beginning. This is this one moment where the father looks away. And we all have so many broken relationships in our lives. Even the good ones have breaks, bad breaks, right? And there was never a break for Jesus and his dad. They were tight. So, and it's rhetorical and it references the Old Testament. You can go read that. I'm trying really hard not to do super deep dives, right? So maybe I'll do that in the future. And I love how the, the women around Jesus, whereas a lot of the dudes scattered, and I know everybody points this out, but it's so true. Uh, outside of John, they were pretty much the only ones who had the guts to go mourn and, 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 and see him on, on the cross. Hardcore. 
And when evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage. And he went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have already died. In summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. And Joseph brought a linen shroud and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. And there are people in positions of authority and power. Not many of us in this world, Paul says. Um, but there are people like Joseph, probably Nicodemus. You know, there are a couple, uh, you know, there are, there are those in those roles. And um, he used his means as a one, his authority, you know, to go actually talk to Pilate. And knowing that he would probably be kicked out of the council or at least, you know, greatly ridiculed. And he gave what he could. He had a fancy grave and he gave it to Jesus. And I love that um, you know you know when you have money and you have authority, there's so many temptations to do the wrong thing. So many like, well, you know, I could do this and I could do that because I could justify it. But the real reason we're given money and authority, and opportunities like that, if you are in a place like that, um, is to be a blessing to Jesus, to God, to his body, people of the church, to the world. And I love that Joseph did that. And I love that I love that God points out that there were people like him. Because most of the people who walked with Jesus that we read about were dirt poor. Even, even we go, well, Peter had a fishing business, and so he's successful, and blah, blah. They were fishermen, okay? They weren't, you know, captains of industry. So, yeah. If you have authority and power, use it for God's glory, not your own. That's the message. And uh, have guts like, like the women that followed Jesus to the cross. So anyway, till next time, day 60. Keep walking. God bless. Bye.